Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to the panel that's going to give you the view of the world from 30,000 feet. <laughs> we did this panel last year, uh, and, and the subject then was getting us back into the air. This year, we're back in the air. So now we're back in the air. Where are we going? And will our bags be there when we get there? <laughs> I'm joined by Luis Gayo. He is, of course, the CEO of IAG, the owner of Iberia, the owner of British Airways, the owner of Aer Lingus. I could go on and on. Uh, and, of course, Dave Calhoun, the CEO of the Boeing Company. Luis, let me start with you. We are back. We are flying. It is fantastic. Everybody wants to go somewhere. They want to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Demand is very, very strong. How sustainable is that demand? It's, uh, good morning, everyone, first of all. Uh, I think it's a very good question, and it's a question that uh, we still don't have the answer. So what we see is that we have a very strong pent-up demand. Uh, this summer, uh, what we see is numbers that, uh, to be honest, uh, we didn't expect. But uh, also when we see the bookings for the rest of the year and the holiday periods, like uh, Christmas, for example, uh, we still see a high demand and a high number of bookings. So we consider that can be uh, maintained uh, in the future. But we need to see. We don't know how it's going to be the behavior of the customer after the COVID. We think there is a change, because uh, uh, people in general, we want to travel. I think after two years that we couldn't do almost anything, uh, we have realized that uh, to travel is one of the experiences that we want to have in this life. Um, and we think it's going to continue in the long term. Dave? We don't have a demand problem. We do have a supply problem. It's everywhere. Yeah. How long is it going to last? When is it going to be fixed? Yeah, it's uh, the shift from uh, avoid and demand to now supply issues to me is uh, remarkable, the speed with which it happened. Um, but we've experienced what Louise described pretty much with all of our customers everywhere in the world. The supply constraints start with the operator. So the ability to get enough people to handle uh, maintenance, handle the lines, uh, keep air airplanes in the air, uh, pilots to fly them, et cetera. So that has uh, dampened the supply side and created some constraints that are, that's so far been well documented here in the U.S. We've had cancellations yep. each and every weekend, et cetera. And then that flows straight through to Boeing and the manufacturing side. We have a big, uh, complicated supply chain with a lot of fra fragility built into it. And it's always been this way. And so finding those supply constraints and, and dealing with them when they appear has been a real issue. It's been a real issue for both manufacturers and will probably stay that way, in my view, almost through the end of next year. And the, and the biggest constraint of all for that mid-tier set of suppliers and sub-tier set of suppliers is labor availability. Yep. Do we have a workforce that can do this? Luis, it, it, I, Dave talks about what is happening. He talks about what is happening around the world. It is everywhere, this supply shortage that we're having. And as Dave says, people are really at the heart of it. What's your view? When do you think it's going to be fixed? As Dave says, the, the news cycle is full of these stories day in, day out. I, I joked at the beginning about, um, is my bag going to get there? I, it is a genuine question. I think a lot of passengers are asking themselves at the moment. How much visibility do you have? When are we going to get supply and demand back into balance? I think that uh, we have a different situation depending on uh, the different regions in the world, different air airports. And in our case, for example, in International Airlines Group, we have uh, several airlines, and the situation that we have in Spain is not the same situation that we have in UK or the situation we yeah. have in Ireland. So during the COVID, uh, we needed to do things to survive. And we had, uh, for example, in Spain, a furlough scheme that was very good, and we could maintain all the employment there. And because of that, the ramp up is easier, because the people, they were prepared uh, to fly. Uh, and then they are flying, for example, in Iberia, close to 90% of the capacity they were flying in 2019, with a punctuality close to 90%. So they are not uh, suffering. You can have uh, uh, punctual problems, but uh, in general, operation is very good. But you have, for example, the case of uh, British Airways in, in, in London, 
where uh, we needed to, to remove 10,000 people because we didn't have any other alternative. We didn't have a fallow skin like the one we had uh, uh, in Spain. So now uh, we almost stopped the machinery, uh, and now uh, we need to come back and we need to hire people, but in a difficult uh, labor market because uh, now the pool of people that they are ready to work is uh, smaller. Um, to hire people, for example, to work uh, in the airport, we need a referencing process that can take 100 days, so it uh, doesn't help. So I think uh, we are competing uh, to have uh, people on the ground. We don't have a shortage of pilots, for example, like in other, yep. in other places in the world, like in the, in the U.S. Uh, our problem is the, the, the ground people to attend the aircraft. So uh, I think uh, we have stabilized the operation for the summer. We have reduced the schedule, for example, in the case of British Airways. Uh, the idea is to offer to the customer uh, a stable operation for the summer, and then after that to improve uh, the punctuality. And I think at the end of the year, we will have uh, again the machinery in, in order. So end of the year? I, th I think so. That's the objective uh, we have. OK. Dave, the big, que the big question everybody's certainly asking themselves in the States is, do we need a recession to fix the problem? Do we need to bring down demand aggressively? The Fed is tightening rates, 75 bips a clip. It clearly wants to slow the economy down. Whether it can deliver a soft landing, or whether or not it delivers a hard landing remains to be seen, but they clearly want to slow demand down. Is that what you think is going to be required to bring this supply-demand balance back into kilter? Yeah, you know, uh, like in Luis's answer to the question, of course, it's not going to affect all industries equally. Um, yep. In the areas uh, and the skills where we compete with other industries, uh, software uh, development, data analytics, uh, computational work. Um, the answer is it probably will help. In some ways, the, uh, the bubble that seems to want to burst in the growth world um, in the U.S. has already been felt by our teams with respect to interest levels and staffing up and yep. doing the things that we have to do. Um, but it's unique to those skills. Right. And so I, I, I won't be... Uh, uh, championing a uh, recession uh, sure you know, talk. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, um, I have no doubt that some slowdown of some sort will be helpful and will create the stability that we need to then start to respond to the demand in aviation, which still is significant. Luis, if demand comes down, but it takes a while for the supply side to come back and fuel prices stay high, isn't there a danger that we end up like it's going to be, you'll feel it in the middle of the P&L that, that we end up with actually costs suddenly exceeding demand. How are you going to manage that balance between those two? It's a very good question. And it's, uh, I think in aviation in general, we are used to handle with a crisis because uh, we always have one. <laughs> so uh, I think that uh, we have the, the ability to adjust the capacity to the demand. I think we have flexibility, for example, with the number of aircraft. During the pandemic, uh, we stopped uh, the 747s, the 34600 in the case of Iberia. Now we have uh, new deliveries uh, for the following years, but we can adjust the capacity to the, to the demand. Also, for example, uh, I think the configuration that we have in the aircraft now uh, is better for this summer because what we see is a strong premium leisure demand. Yep. Uh, and it's something that uh, uh, the, the, the configuration that we have right now is better for this type of demand that we are experiencing now. So I think it's going to be tough the following uh, months. We need to see what happens with the Ukraine situation, with the fuel price. For us, it's very important. In uh, 2019, it was 26% of our cost, the, the, the fuel price. Uh, the good thing is uh, now we have a hedge position. Uh, above 70% for the rest of the year, but it's true that for 2023 is uh, only 25%. Right. So we need to see the evolution. Uh, but yes, the, what we need to, to, the art of all this is to maintain the cost and to adapt the capacity to the demand. Uh, but I think we know how to do it, and we did it in the past. 
I was talking to Scott Kirby of United a couple of days ago, just down the road, and he was saying that he's, he, he now believes that where jet fuel is now, and for those that don't know, it's basically doubled, um, where jet fuel is now is now his base case. He thinks it stays at these kinds of elevated levels. Is that consistent with your thinking? In our projections, we consider next year is going to be a little lower, but we don't know. We don't have a, yeah. a, a crystal ball. So what we do always is to, to be prepared for the worst, and then if uh, the environment is better, uh, we will have uh, better numbers. Uh, but uh, I think uh, to have high fuel doesn't mean that uh, you cannot be profitable. And we see in the history of aviation periods of high fuel price uh, where airlines, uh, they were profitable. Uh, I think it's also... Does assume high fares. Yes, it, and it also assumes, assumes a level playing field. I think uh, depending on uh, how your competitors are hit, uh, how, yes, how you can transfer in some way yep. the cost to the price. If, if fuel prices stay where they are now, Dave, what does that mean for aircraft demand? Um, I, I, I believe there are two things working on aircraft demand. Um, one is the, uh, the efficiency of the airplane itself, and I think Luis handled that well so far with price elasticity demonstrating what it is. Uh, I think they can maintain more margins at this kind, this kind of level. I think the other, uh, which means that the demand scenario for airplanes will continue at the right. pace it is. I think the other subject that now is becoming as important as the efficiency of an airplane is the emissions of an airplane. Absolutely. And sustainability today, um, uh, the emphasis on it, uh, I don't think it's going to change. I think it's going to get even more severe. Um, we're going to have to meet that demand. Every new airplane, if it replaces or displaces an old airplane, is roughly 20 to 40 percent more efficient and therefore less emissions than the airplane it replaced. So that in and of itself is one of the biggest and most important levers for the industry to get ahead of emissions. And there are many more, including sustainable aviation fuel and other things. But yep. when we think about fleet planning today, um, it's almost becoming equal parts efficiency and emissions. And the pressures are going to get more severe, probably the, not less. The, I, I hear what you're saying on, on that argument, and I, and I hear it a lot. The problem is, though, that if demand continues and, and in aggregate demand for travel grows, if demand for travel is growing at 20%, and aircraft are becoming 20% more efficient, you're not really getting anywhere. If demand increases by 30% and aircraft emissions increase, uh, 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 and efficiency sort of improves by 20%, you're actually going backwards. Yeah. So, so are we on the right course? Are we on the right track right now? Because you've got a total volume of CO2 produced. Each individual flight may be more efficient, but in aggregate, we're not. Well, it's all about the displacement. So in other words, there's a current rate of displacement today. For every two airplanes an airline buys, they replace one. And the other one is to handle growth. Yep. Right? So if you increase and recapitalize that base in any way, and I believe incentives would be required to do it, you will increase the displacement rate. If you do that, you will, get, you will bring emissions down. And then the second part of this one is sustainable aviation fuel, which in our case in 2030, Every airplane that we deliver will be capable of 100% uh, sustainable aviation fuel, so something other than jet aviation fuel yep. that we know today. Um, and that is where the biggest improvement will, will be felt and will come. Again, it depends on displacement rates. You have to replace old with new. Um, so uh, anyway, those two factors are, in my view, very different than the last four decades. Um, a simple fact that emissions is going to become as important. And I think a lot of policy incentives and a lot of policies are going to have to get written around the world to make sure that that happens. Yeah, I, the, the industry is buying every molecule of sustainable aviation fuel it can right now. It just, we have a feedstock issue, we have an availability issue. Luis, kerosene though, jet fuel is, is really expensive. We've already discussed the fact that it has almost doubled. The spread between jet fuel and SAF, therefore, has narrowed significantly. How does that affect? The, you guys have made some, some, some big, big bets on making sure that you can make this transfer work. Um, we live in a time of turbulence right now, but as you see kerosene prices coming up, as jet fuel comes up, 
that spreads narrow, that spreads narrow, that spread narrows. Let me get those words out. Um, how does that affect the timeline? How do, does it accelerate it? Are you changing your thinking? How are you thinking about that transfer right now? In IEG, uh, we define a roadmap uh, to arrive to, in 2050 to net zero emissions, and we were the first uh, group of airlines uh, worldwide to, to, to do that. And also, we have the commitment that in 2030, 10% of our flights will be powered by sustainable aviation fuel. So we are buying now all the, uh, all the sustainable aviation fuel that is available in the market, and as you say, it's not enough. So what uh, we are... Uh, so you would buy more if, if it was ready now, you would buy more? Yes, I think uh, it's something that uh, is uh, good to do because uh, in, in, in the long term, unless we have more plants producing sustainable aviation fuel, uh, we are not going to have enough uh, for everybody. So we are investing, we are investing a lot of money uh, to try to develop sustainable aviation fuel uh, for our, our necessities in the future. So uh, I think that uh, what is important is that the governments, they put in place policies to invest in new plants of sustainable aviation fuel. I think, for example, that in Europe, if we want to, to achieve the objective of the 10% of sustainable aviation fuel in 2030, we need around 30 plants. Uh, so what we think is that if we want to arrive to that objective, instead of uh, putting taxes uh, to the fuel in some way, yep. what we need to incentivize is the, the investment in plants and investment uh, in, in SAF. And for example, we, we see that uh, what is happening in, in the States, I think they are doing uh, very well. They are incentivizing uh, the production of SAF and is the way at the end to arrive to the objectives that we have. Okay, um, I'm gonna go to some questions on the floor. We've only got four minutes left. Cargo, cargo kept this industry going during the downturn. Um, we're now seeing a significantly increased demand for cargo freighters. Dave, what does that demand look like right now? How big a shift is there pre-pandemic to post-pandemic in terms of demand for freighters? Well, demand for freighters, uh, I mean, it didn't get impacted at all um, yep. uh, over the pandemic, which is a remarkable you know, fact. And beyond that, many of the cargo holds and passenger airplanes um, were filled and flew with very few passengers during this period. So we had an yep. overall very significant going. increase. Yeah. And we see, that, we see that, that demand continuing for quite some time. So uh, our, own, our own view is that um, demand for cargo airplanes specifically and for cargo, cargo uh, uh, the capability to carry cargo on passenger airplanes, that's a differentiator with, with respect to airplane types. So we'll continue to want to play to that, and um, I view it as, a, again, a supplemented demand if you compare it to the couple of decades yep. before the pandemic and probably one that will continue for a long time. Luis, Alicon Cogue? Yes, uh, we don't have uh, freighters in yep. IAG, but uh, during the pandemic, uh, I think cargo was uh, one of the business that uh, performed uh, very, very well, and I think they continue in that direction. The thing is, uh, uh, as we are recovering the, the passengers, we have uh, less, uh, in some way, uh, less space uh, for, for the cargo. Also, yep. during the pandemic, you could uh, fly an aircraft uh, wherever you want it. Now, the schedule... Uh, is uh, directed uh, because you have passengers that they want to go from one place to the other, and then in that aircraft we put uh, cargo in the belly. But uh, for us, I think it's uh, going to be a business that is going to continue uh, helping in the future, but uh, we are not going to have the same number of cargo-only flights that uh, we had uh, during the pandemic. It, it takes us to kind of what are aeroplanes going to look like in the future. We've talked about demand, we've talked about sustainable, sustainable aviation fuel, we've talked about what is going to power the future of flight. Dave, how different do aircraft look, not now, but in 20, 30 years' time? You're in a long-cycle business. Are we... Are we are we going to stick with the kind of the tube and wing model that we currently have? Are aircraft going to look significantly different? It, it does, in some ways, come back to the sort of freight story as well. What kind of planes are we going to be flying on? Yeah, I, I think if you go out 20 or 30 years, which is probably the right way to think about it, because airplane lives last 50 years, yep. uh, typically. Um, I think it's going to just be, it's all about sustainability. Anything and everything we can bring to an airplane to increase its, its sustainable footprint, um, that'll be a differentiator if we go out that far. 
And so uh, I think for our company, that's how we think about it. It's not strictly efficiency. Uh, I do think it'll still look like the tube and wing you described, yep. but with a, with a lot of digital tools that allow for optimization of flights, um, more integration with, uh, with uh, all, uh, the management systems on the ground, um, uh, a total commitment to sustainable aviation fuel and hopefully an industry and a feedstock system that supports it. Um, all of those factors together um, and sort of a seal of approval that this is a sustainable airplane for the, for, the long, for the long term, that will be a bigger differentiator than our historic you know, process of, a lo yep. a, of more efficiency based on a more efficient engine. Yeah. Gentlemen, oh, sorry, Luis. No, I, I was going to say that also, also in our road plan to the net zero emissions, we consider that the new technologies and hydrogen uh, will be key. Um, we don't know what's going to happen in 30 years, yeah. but uh, we are sure that uh, maybe uh, in the next 20 years we will have uh, hydrogen aircraft uh, flying with uh, but a small uh, aircraft. I think the white body, you know better than me, but uh, it's going to take more time to have a solution. Hydrogen and electric, is, they're coming, without a yeah. doubt. It's just the time frame to 2050. Yeah. It'll, it'll probably affect much smaller airplanes. Um, on those two fronts, and then someday, maybe in that next second half of the century, we can get there in the big ones. They're coming, we're going. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. We <laughs> greatly appreciate it. Dave Calhoun, <laughs> Luis Gallego, this, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, guys. Thank you.